I want you to meet Bakr Ali. He's a new immigrant from Iraq. I fought with him against Al Qaeda in Iraq, shoulder to shoulder. We walked the streets of Samarra together, planned raids together, and he saved American lives. He is and will always be my brother. He now lives in Houston, where he's been the top salesman at an Acura dealership for months running. Now he's in the home building business. Smart guy with all those liberals fleeing to Texas. He's a Muslim, and he and his beautiful family love America. You should hear them gush about it proudly in English. He earned his pathway to America. After three years of fighting the State Department bureaucracy, he earned a visa to this country, and he's made good on it, proud and free. But when Joe Biden and the Democrats talk about refugees, they're not talking about Bakker. They want different Americans. Which brings me to this. Each year, the White House notifies Congress of the maximum number of refugees the executive branch plans to allow into our country in the coming year. This number is known as the refugee ceiling. Because there is no glass ceiling the left doesn't want to shatter, right? Why not crash that one as well? Well, yesterday, the people in charge at the White House, whoever that is, announced they would raise the refugee ceiling for next year to the highest level in American history, the highest ever, to a goal of 125,000 authorized refugees next year. A number higher than's ever been given in a single year, even to, say, Jews in World War II Germany. For reference, that number, 125,000, equals the population of, say, Fargo, North Dakota, or Wilmington, North Carolina. No big deal, right? Well, by the way, this 125,000 refugees is on top of the hundreds of thousands of illegals flooding our southern border. Totally different headcounts. Add them together, and now you're talking the size of Miami, Minneapolis, or Atlanta every year. Today, the White House defended the move. He wanted to eliminate any lingering doubt from any refugee across the world that the United States uh, wasn't a country that would welcome refugees in to apply under the Biden-Harris administration. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Jen. The message is clear. There is no doubt. America is wide open. And we have no reason to believe the numbers won't grow even more. Because just last month, the White House announced they're considering an entirely new category of refugees. Climate refugees. Refugees used to have to be fleeing war or persecution. Now they need only be fleeing the weather. We would be the first country to do so on the planet to make this designation. Well, I guess another global ceiling for us to break. Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, is now charged with delivering a report on the topic in August. Stay tuned. I smell yet another executive order. And who better to do it than Jake, formerly of the Yale Center for the Study of Globalization. But he's not just a globalist Yaley. He grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. More on why that matters in a moment. You see, this refugee increase, like everything else Biden and company have done, was a craven cave to the anti-American open borders left. Their base freaked out two weeks ago when, in light of the border crisis that they wouldn't admit, the White House initially planned to keep the refugee number set by the Trump administration. Orange man good? Mm. On the heels of the rise of ISIS and the migrant invasion of borderless Europe, remember that? President Trump put a ban on refugees from certain countries and sharp cuts to overall refugee admission. Seems sensible to me, right? America first. But those days are gone. So 2020. Common sense once again crushed by sheer ideology. As we know, the White House has gone full on globalist, not just on borders and refugees, but even on, get this, taxes. The White House also just announced they're seeking a global minimum tax to pay for their endless domestic spending. This is Council of Economic Advisors chair and Harvard University lifer. Cecilia Rouse defending the tax. Internationally, we don't want to be disadvantaged. So he's also working with other countries so that we have a minimum tax internationally so that there's not a race but, to the but, bottom. But. Ah, Harvard grads, they love fancy phrases like race to the bottom. Now, when I think of race to the bottom, I think of my Minnesota Vikings and what they do every year in the NFC North. OK, as a recovering Harvard grad myself, though, Harvard man, allow me to translate. She means we can't allow countries to lower their tax rates to entice business. We all must pay more. 
the global system will be fed. Not to mention the globalist climate scheme this White House is obsessed with. We all laughed and then we cried, watching masked up Joe Biden attempt to convince communist China to give up emissions over a Zoom call. Maybe he was just trying to show solidarity with the residents of Beijing, who wear masks every day to deal with smog. Because, well... We're like, the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And your biggest issue is... Your, your biggest issue is how are we going to pay for it? And, like, this is the war. This is our World War II. Like, this is World War II. That was two years ago. We now only have 10 years left. Enjoy the roaring 20s because the dead 30s are coming. Speaking of Biden advisors, that brings me back to Minneapolis. What does unchecked illegal immigration and massive waves of refugees look like without assimilation? It looks like this. Globalist Joe, that's Ilhan Omar. Global Joe, just like Jake Sullivan, loves Ilhan Omar which underscores why his refugee move yesterday is so dangerous. Ilhan Omar was a refugee. She came to America as a young girl, fleeing the civil war in Somalia. Following four years in a refugee camp in Kenya, she was granted asylum to the United States, eventually settling in Minneapolis. She graduated high school there, attended college in North Dakota, and secured a prestigious policy fellowship at the University of Minnesota. A few years later, she was elected to the State House and then to Congress. Congresswoman Omar has chosen to return American goodwill with grievance, not gratitude. You've heard her. She views her time in Somalia as blissful, while criticizing the United States as racist, oppressive, and torturous. That's a direct quote. Unlike my good friend Bakr Ali, Ilhan Omar did not choose America. America chose her from the squalor of a refugee camp in Kenya. We opened our doors and welcomed her. The state of Minnesota housed her, educated her, empowered her, enriched her, elevated her, and then elected her. All so she could make a living out of condemning America. Now she is setting the terms of U.S. Ref refugee policy inside the halls of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. She is the authority. And she wants more refugees just like her. Moments ago, I mentioned the word assimilation. Shh. Don't say that word too loud. You're not supposed to say that word anymore. You may have missed it, but when the news came out last week that the Department of Homeland Security was banning use of the words like illegal and alien for ICE and the CBP, they also included ending the use of the word assimilation. What is this evil idea of assimilation? The left says it's xenophobic, but of course it's not. It's essential. New immigrants must seek to assimilate and pledge allegiance to the United States of America. Assimilation and allegiance, if you want a nation. Without those, those ingredients, we melt down in our melting pot and destroy what holds us together. Our tribes, our skin color, our sexual preferences, and our religious denominations are not what make us Americans. Our God-given freedoms, equally applied laws, and common English language do. If we don't share values, share civics, and share language, we soon become balkanized and feckless Europe. Now, now that I think about it, that might be what the left actually has in mind. Waves of refugees with no duty to assimilate, and worse, nothing to assimilate to. Why would you want to assimilate to a country that is systemically racist? If America is evil and assimilation is evil, then our future is inevitably anti-American, government-dependent, and non-English speaking. And if you don't think that means Democrat votes, then I have a bridge to sell you in Mogadishu. What does this all look like? Well, just five years ago, I hit the streets of Minneapolis, Minnesota for Fox and Friends, a neighborhood dubbed Little Mogadishu with a majority Somali Muslim population. This is what we found. The Islamic schools in here in Minnesota, they teach Sharia law. Yeah, Sharia law. And what do they teach also American law, the U.S. Constitution? Mm, actually, I have no idea about that one. We're here with Fox News just doing a story about the Riverside area. No English? Any, any at all? No? Just wanted to see if I could ask you a couple quick questions. No English. Would you be willing to chat with us? No, it's language. No, uh, no English? No English. This was not the exception. Truth is, Ilhan Omar's Minnesota is a preview of what the White House wants for a city near you. Just look at old Europe, which already has it. 
Europe decided long ago to open its borders, not demand assimilation or allegiance from new arrivals, and gut their militaries to pay for their welfare states. It was a perfect recipe for division, dependency, and decline. It's what Global Joe wants here. And led along by Ilhan Omar and Comrade Cortez, he's doing it. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.